Hi, this is Shane Vryan from the Bad Boys Podcast. While the Bad Boys Podcast is on a break, I decided to launch a brand new show featuring interviews with some amazing guests that we've had, as well as new interviews that I've done on my radio show on LAFM. I've had so many interviews that I've done and so many more planned now. The show is called A Long Way to the Top, and if you'd like to hear more, then search for Long Way to the Top on the platform that you're listening to right now. Enjoy this special Bad Boys presentation of Long Way to the Top. This is Long Way to the Top, and I'm your host, Shane Bryan. In the words of the immortal ACDC, it is harder than it looks. These interviews will give you a glimpse into the lives of the artists that we've sung along with, danced and rocked out to. Some go deep into their past and others celebrate their recent releases. But all of them show that regardless of who you are, it's always a long way to the top. Ed Cooper co-founded one of the first punk bands in Australia. Dare I say, the first. The Saints were one of the foremost influential punk rock groups in the world. According to Bob Geldof, rock music in the 70s was changed by three bands. The Sex Pistols, the Ramones and the Saints. In the late 70s, he changed direction and dabbled with some rock, soul and avant jazz with the Laughing Clowns. He's a double ARIA winner, Queensland Music Awards winner, Lifetime Achievement Award winner and is about to embark on a very extensive tour, the exploding universe of Ed Cooper. Ed Cooper joins us on today's episode of Long Way to the Top. Ed, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. Pleasure to be here. You have, have had a, an incredible, incredible uh, life in music in Australia, and you, you call the tour the exploding universe, but your your universe really did explode, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, I guess. I guess, you know, I mean, you sort of start doing something and then you see other things that you want to do and it's kind of just, you know, one thing rolls off another kind of... So, uh, yeah, I was lucky enough, I guess, to have the opportunity to do that. But I guess also, you know, the um, the motivation to kind of keep going back even when things weren't sort of working that well commercially sort of thing. Mm. And, of course, 40 years on from the first release from The Saints, I'm Stranded, you released it again and you sold it's out. 47. 47 years on from the first release. Were you surprised that the the record sold out as quick as it did? Yeah, I don't think anyone was expecting that. I think it sold out in about an hour or something. So, um, yeah, mm. that's that's the beauty of the internet. We didn't have that back in 1976. Yeah, I know. I got on and after I got the email and they were already gone. And, uh, of course, you did three different versions of the of the singles. Let's go back to those early days of the Saints uh, when you formed the band, uh, you know, along with along with uh, Chris Bailey. Did you yeah. sort of well, expect? I, I, well, don't, 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 don't forget about Ivor, Ivor Hay there. And I mean, yes, exactly. I both of them, and uh, you know, like it was a a trio. That was the core mm. of mm. the band. Then once once they thought it was a really good idea to get involved in this as well, and um, yeah, so just just sort of, you know, balancing it out. It, 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 it wouldn't have happened without Ivor. Or it would, yes. have been, maybe, would have been different, you know. Would have been different. What was the, the desire to go down that punk route? Well, it wasn't a desire to go down a punk route because there wasn't a punk route. Mm. It was a desire to kind of play the sort of music that I wanted to hear. Um, I was writing songs that, I wanted to hear, you know, mm. and I was playing the guitar in the way that I wanted to hear guitar. So, but but in terms of punk, you know, like the the term when we started, which was in nineteen seventy three. So it's actually like the fiftieth anniversary of the band forming this year, mm. and punk was. Um, you know, like a term that was used for sixties garage band sort of thing. So it wasn't, mm. it wasn't. We weren't looking at. I, I didn't foresee the punk rock explosion in the UK or anything like mm. that. It was it was something just, you know, just a happy coincidence that a few years later punk kind of did happen in the UK 
way, and that gave us a kind of an entrance into the um, uh, into the world that existed outside of Brisbane, mm. which mm. was quite large. <laughs> very large, very large. What we was the? We didn't know that. Exactly. Yeah, what was the reception like in in the UK, where obviously you know punk was was a a pretty big thing. Um, it's a single but a great response, you know. I mean, mm. that, that's that's what led to record company interest. I mean, we weren't expecting that either, you know. Mm. Um, uh, it, it got in the month of October. It got three reviews in Sound magazine, you know, calling it single of the week, then the next week it was single of this and every other week, <laughs> and then a fortnight later it was the single of the year before the year had finished kind of thing, so mm. that was, yeah, I mean, you probably can't hope for a better response than that. <laughs> to balance it out though, we got our, our first review anywhere, it was a week earlier in Duke magazine at, out of Melbourne in those days, and it said it was one of the worst records ever released, so um, <laughs> You know, there's, there's yin and yang. <laughs> what do they know anyway, seriously? <laughs> well, that, you know, yes, well, exactly. I mean, <laughs> I, it, I think everyone just laughed at that review. I mean, I don't, I don't think we were hurt by it or anything. Yeah. I, and, you know, this is the whole thing about, the one thing that I've loved about you and your career is that you've always remained experimental. You know, to to go from punk to the bands and the and the album names, the Oxley Creek Playboys, the Institute of Nude Wrestling. I mean, you you just seem to push the boundaries, and you went, okay, well, I'm going to go experimental, almost avant garde to a certain point, and I'm going to do whatever I want to do. Yeah, well, I I, I think it's it, it's a, a worthwhile thing to try to pursue. You know, mm. if if the music is kind of what's driving you. In fact, you know, for me, I, I, you know, I don't think I'd be very good at just, you know, being a session player or yeah. being in a band that kind of goes out on the road, does the same thing every night, because that's what, you know, the audience of certain bands want to hear. And so, you know, to keep selling records, to keep working, you got to do that. I, I, I didn't take that path. That's, mm. that's absolutely true. And, you know, I, I don't regret that, even though sort of commercial logic would indicate that you'd do things differently. You know, the Saints had split up in 1978, you know, at a time when had we stayed together and kind of done a sort of an amalgamation of our first couple of albums, keep keeping that sound going, yeah. we probably would have been really successful, you know. Mm. But it would have been a weird thing to do because... Um, it requires going on stage and doing a, a routine mm. as opposed to actually communicating music. So, you know, like it, 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 I, I'm not being necessarily critical of bands that, that do that routine because yeah, that's what they've chosen to do and, you know, it's up to them. Yeah. But it doesn't feel to me like I'm being presented with anything significant. It might be really good, but mm. it doesn't, it, 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 to me, it's sort of, even if it is really good, it's people going through the motions mm. to some extent. So, you know, that was how I felt about it. And so mm. I thought, I, I don't want to do that. I, I kind of, I guess it's like, you know, you, you get to that point of, do I just settle in my career or do I push the boundaries and do things that are, are different that may or may not work out? I'm aware that, you know, there's a risk and, and I mean, there's a risk that it won't work. Uh, there's a risk that it does work and people don't like it. But, you know, you, you, you still, you got to have, have some sort of belief in yourself, you know, like, you know, I, I, I don't want to sound like I'm lecturing or anything, you yeah. know, like it's just that that's what I decided to do. Yeah. And looking back on it, you know, I know that, you know, Sometimes it would have been more sensible not to do it, just in terms of selling more records, mm. and in terms of having, um, in, in some ways, a more sort of predictable experience live. You know, mm. it, yeah. But I, I, I didn't. <laughs> so, I, I know, I know yeah. exactly what you mean. It's, it's, it's. Um... It's kind of like the key to, to creativity, and I think that's the one thing that that I've appreciated a, about your music and and your guitar work, is that 
you're always striving for that creativity. And I feel that sometimes if we settle, it can be missing. Yeah, I, I, I sort of also have a fairly short attention span from time to time, you know, and so yeah. I get bored with stuff. <laughs> I, I'm not a, not a comfortable on stage kind of performer, you know, like mm. I don't feel the stage is my home or anything like that. So I feel if I'm mm. up there, I've got to actually be doing something that is, is, uh, you know, an attempt at, at communication, mm. a, a, you know, some sort of way of, of sort of getting over to people. Mm. And, you know, it doesn't always work. So, mm. you know, there, there, there's no, there's no short fire. You know, I don't have a real routine except for the fact that I try not to, well, I, I don't even have that much trouble mm. not repeating myself sort of thing. So, <laughs> so, so you're not going to get up and do the greatest hits and, okay, thanks oh, for coming. We, 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 we might. We might. You, might. you know, I haven't done, haven't, haven't done that all that often. So, <laughs> um, I mean, well, on this tour, we're looking at, at sort of drawing largely from the albums that are the first two in the mm. reissue campaign. And that's Electrical Storm and Honey Steel's Gold. So we're mm. going to be playing songs from those albums and using the uh, recorded versions as, as a starting point. You know, I won't, yes. sometimes I don't do that. Sometimes I sort of just, if I go on a tour and I'm putting a set together, I'll just run through the songs as I recall them. Yeah, uh, which is sometimes not exactly the same as, as the recorded versions anyway, because I haven't listened to the recorded versions for a long time. But we're going to sort of start with the recorded versions and then sort yeah. of see where each night takes us. And and that I think will be really exciting. You should hope, you know, even if the set list is the same, the performances will differ a bit, and um, you know, each thing kind of works in its own way yeah. so we're doing those two albums and we're also because that's a fair bit of stuff to play in a night anyway mm. we're, we're doing a, a, a handful of songs from around that time so mm. it's like it's it's largely the decade between 1985 and the mid-90s kind of thing mm. that's that material is going to be drawn from that time i don't think we're going to bother Going, you know, I don't, I don't think I need to make the point. Oh well, I did an album called Lost Cities. We're not going to do anything off that, mm, you know. Mm, it's, yeah, it, mm. it, it's so in that way, it's it, it's a kind of um, a fairly traditional sort of approach, I guess. Yeah, yeah. What was your uh, inspiration musically uh, in in I guess you know, and and I guess it's probably changing all the time and evolving all the time. But when you first picked up that guitar. The, the reason I got a guitar was because I I think I was eight years old or nine years old um, when I heard the Beatles Love Me Do. I think it was must have been the year that they um, were touring Australia because like we didn't have a record player and my parents didn't listen to pop radio kind of thing. But still, it was so, so early in the piece that there wasn't even sort of like the mid 60s boom mm. so maybe it was something that was played on one of the stations mum was listening to but anyway I heard Love Me Do and that that opening harmonica thing just immediately got me and I kind of could, couldn't get it out of my head you know mm. and I suppose because maybe there must have been a lot of press around because it, it just kind of you know got, got through to me and I just started advocating that they buy me a guitar. Mum mm. wanted me to learn how to play the piano, and I just really wanted to play the guitar. And I think Dad sort of thought, well, a guitar is going to be a lot cheaper than a piano, so maybe <laughs> indulge me. <laughs> <laughs> Good on Dad. Do you do you regret not learning the piano? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I. I play in a very, very rudimentary way, but yes, um, I think that, you know, it, it, in the guitar's favour, it's sort of, it's the closest thing to a piano, but you can carry it around with you sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, let's be honest, the guitar's a lot sexier than the piano. Uh, it depends who's doing it. Really. <laughs> <laughs> you, you 
throwing, throwing down the gauntlet. Eh? <laughs> uh, and who would you say is your, you know, I guess guitar hero growing up? Uh, you mentioned the Beatles. It depends, like, you know, what you mean by growing up. When I was a kid, I mean, from, from that point, I, I was always interested in music, even mm. before the Beatles sort of thing, you know, like, it, it, uh, according to my parents, um, you know, I was writing songs in the same pit sort of thing, you know. Wow. great, Some great sort of concepts, too. I, I apparently wrote a song about a, a toy steam engine that I had that turned into a rocket ship, so I'm going to I'm going to develop that maybe concept album for my next release or something. <laughs> what a great so, idea! Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um, one I didn't know who was doing what on records, um, yeah. so I liked I liked records, you know. Like it, yes. it, so for me, the Beatles. It, it wasn't that important who was doing what. It was more just the overall thing. My next, you know, when the Beatles got a little bit sort of sort of folk rocky in in the mid sixties, I switched my number one allegiance to the Easy Beats. Yeah. Who was sort of, you know, like the sort of a bit, bit like the Beatles, obviously inspired by the Beatles, but were kind of just sticking with rock and roll for a bit longer, you yes. know. I, I guess they were just a year behind where the Beatles were <laughs> or something. But it, that that coincided exactly with what I wanted. So whoever was playing the guitar um, whether it was Harry or George, I don't know who was doing which bits, and um, they, you know, they were great guitarists. You know, yes. what, however they, you know, um, aligned, assigned their, um, their their musical roles there. Um, then, you know, just over time, I don't know if, if I've ever really had. Like oh, favorite guitar. There, there are a lot of them, you know. Like yeah. by the time I got into my teens, I I, I thought Tony Iommi from Black Sabbath was just fantastic. Yeah. Um, I yeah. just loved. He still what, is. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll I'll confine my admiration for the first six albums, but it was just such a a great great sound. Um, Pete Townsend, you know, I, I bought the Who Live at Leeds when I was about 14 or 15, and that was just such a killer guitar sound. And it was because Tony Iommi and Pete Townsend both played SGs that I went on to buy an SG because I really wanted a bit of that action, you know. It was sort of, um, and I thought you could do that by buying the guitar that they played. But um, I found out later it's not really how you do it. But um, Ron Ashton uh, from the Stooges was yeah. sort of that the Stooges funhouse. That was an eye opener for me. That that kind of got me on the road to looking back in a lot of ways to yeah. start developing um, like a real. Like just not not just on what was coming out at the time, new stuff, but mm. to actually go back and sort of educate myself a bit about what had gone on before. So mm. you know, my first stop was sort of the 1950s, and to sort of get into get to know what the sort of really great rock and roll musicians mm. were doing. So. You know, through that process, you know, Bo Diddley, brilliant guitarist, yeah. Chuck Berry, you know, like I think probably the most important guitarist overall, mm. Eddie Cochran, uh, Buddy Holly, you know, that that kind of stuff. And then I also started to get into blues, and mm. I, you know, I was a massive fan of Jimmy Reed and Elmore James. So you know, all that stuff kind yeah. of found its way in. I, sometime around when I heard Ron Ashton, I also heard Lou Reed and the Velvet Underground, um, another major sort of influence, Fred Smith, the rhythm guitarist from yep. the MC5. I was, was just brilliant. You know, I could go on forever, yeah. but to sort of say who's a favourite, I don't know. I like the guitarists in the Gary Glitter band, you know. They, I don't know who they even were, but that guitar sound was just fucking fantastic. Yeah. And, um, you know that was an influence on on me during the Saints 
era, you know. Yeah. Hello, it's good to be back. You know, I know it's it's probably inappropriate to sort of say anything positive about Gary, but uh, it, yeah, exactly. But he had, he had good music. Are those records, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, those records are the records, and and yeah. I loved them at the time. Yeah, and I, I still do. You know, they're, they're still a part of. Um, so uh, and you know, I'll. I'll I'll confine my guitarist finds into, I'll, I'll go just a little bit further. The two guys in the original Alice Cooper band, um, right. Michael Buxton and uh, Dennis Dunaway, I, I can't, a bit embarrassing, I don't actually remember their names, but, yeah. um, and then later I sort of like got to hear and like some bluegrass guitarists and, um, more, more sort of banjo, mandolin kind of stuff in that yeah. sort of area. But you know, uh, James Blood Olmer, the jazz inverted commas guitar player. You know, yeah. t- t- tons of stuff. You know, just just things. And, and sometimes, you know, maybe not even a you know whole albums worth of stuff. Yeah. It's just oh, I really like you know that eight bars or something or twelve bars or whatever in, in, in that song and isn't isn't that little bit great, you know, that's so, so I don't know, I just sort of um but it, but I hardly ever pulled records apart in terms of, you know, analysing how oh, the bass is doing this, the drums are doing that. Um to me I, I kind of listen to it as one kind of thing and that mm. the way that I listened to it was sort of the biggest influence on how I played because when I started writing I didn't have a band and so what I was doing on guitar kind of had to be everything yeah. you know, apart from the vocal sort of thing so that that was sort of what I was aiming at and then when, when the Saints got together originally it was as I say it was a Three piece band, and I've all played piano. We didn't have bass or drums, so um, you know, that was sort of just building slightly on, on what I was kind of already seeing and um, hearing, whatever. Yeah, mm. but, but but I guess in 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 looking at it at music in its total uh, sound rather than picking it apart, it really gave you not just an appreciation for everyone else in the band. But it really put you on that path that 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 you went on for your you know eighteen solo albums, where like you knew what the sound was that you wanted to to put out with those albums. Well, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, up 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 to a point. Uh, like I, I also hopefully, but depending how quickly things were recorded, but mm. you know sometimes it's quite good to go with. Um, you know, like accidents can happen mm. and, uh, you know, something sort of appears to you when you're recording, which is different to when you're just playing. Mm. So it you use the, to, to some extent, you use the recording process to also um, work as part of what, what you're doing. And so you kind of, it, it's good to be open mm. to, oh, well, you know, I didn't think that would happen, but that's actually better than what I thought would happen, kind mm-hmm. of thing. So it's good to go with that sort of. Thing. When when you come to an album, uh, you know, especially during you know all of the these different sort of phases in your career, do you look at that album and go, okay, I've got a certain um, theme that I want to approach with this album, or is it is it very it's much a mixture? Well, it, it it actually sort of varies. No, I, I suppose each album does have a theme, mm. and I usually go in with uh, some idea of the sort of atmosphere that the songs mm. that are going to be included, you know, and how that should sort of work. Mm. And I think usually I, I sort of succeed at, at getting that in the way that I want to. Um, you know, I mean, it's hard hard to talk about albums that you've done yourself because mm. you, you kind of just become absolutely saturated in, yeah. in the process of putting them down. So it's hard sometimes to listen back. Um, I mean, it's great when you listen back and you think, wow, that's that's just really fantastic. I wouldn't change a thing. Yeah. Sometimes you hear things that, uh, you know, gee, it would have been nice to have done that a bit differently or something. But 
I'd, I'd, I'd live with them, you know. I mean, I, I don't have a favourite record of my own. Mm. I, I don't like one song more than the other. They're all kind of, kind of part of the the overall thing, you know. Mm. Thinking back over your time with the Saints, and uh, you know, knowing that uh, you know you were there for the first few albums, and uh, and then you, you know, obviously there was breakups, and and then you went solo. Do you think back now that you know that Chris is 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 no longer with us, and go, gee, I really wish that you know we could have got back together one final time. Um. Uh, yeah. I, no. Um. I. 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 I think it. I think it's a, a shame what happened after the Saints split. I mean, we were really good friends while the Saints were together. Or I thought so, anyway. Yeah. Um, what happened after that, I wish, had have been resolved very quickly, and it could have been resolved probably in the early 80s, yeah. and it wasn't, and it, it was detrimental to both of our careers because the first three Saints albums were just like... It, 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 that was just a, a fucking mess, you know. We, mm. we we made nothing from those records, and I think that had there been some unity between us, and had there just been a yeah a, a, some some kind of agreement, mm. uh, a lot of things could have been a lot better in that regard. Mm. Um, as far as working together, in in um, I, I have worked with Chris. I had worked with Chris um, a few times after mm. the Saints split. Once he asked me to play bass in his a new Saints, which I did for half a tour. I had to actually just quit because um, mm. the, the, the tour manager and the, the tour structure and everything about it was just uh, really against every kind of... <laughs> Principle, and you know, I'm not being high and mighty about it, but it was just mm. really shit else. Um, <laughs> just so, so, so music industry, all the stuff that I really don't like, you know. Yeah. And um, we did that. That wasn't. I, I certainly wouldn't think that was a success. Um, even though mm. Ticket as soon as they, they see, I, I also joined on the basis that um, there would be no big deal made about it. It wouldn't be uh, like this is a big reunion or something. Yes. And they, the, Chris and his management said, okay. And then the next day, it's I'm in the Saints, you know. Yeah. And it, it, you know, I'm playing bass on songs that I had no real engagement in. It was all Chris's sort of solo yeah. Saints mm. stuff. Um, you know, some of which I thought were good, others I, I wasn't that crazy about, and. Mm. You know, I was playing bass, you know, yeah. which is sort of something I only ever did if no one else was around to do it. <laughs> yeah. So um, that wasn't all that great. We we got together in the on, we got together on September 11, 2001. Um, wow. For the that was an auspicious date. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, we got inducted into the Aria Hall of Fame. Yes. And then after, we like, and that was a shit house experience, too. And, <laughs> but, you know, we, we tried to sort of be uh, sort of chummy and we're yeah. sitting around afterwards having dinner and some drinks. And Chris's wife got a take the call from a friend in New York and then suddenly, you know, um, <laughs> All hell broke so, loose. I mean, yeah. that was that was just for a, a you know a, a ten minute set. So imagine mm. if we had have gotten back together to do a tour, it would have meant the end of the world or something. Yeah. Was, um, <laughs> I don't think you were responsible for <laughs> September eleven. <laughs> well, we certainly lost the front cover of the Australian, which yeah. was, like there was a wrap around. You know, like they had the old. It was already printed, and then they put a wrap around it, so wow. we didn't make the um, front cover, front page. Um, and then you know we did we did uh, the Pig City reunion. That was a one-off show. That was also just extremely difficult. Yeah. Um, I think then we did uh, ATP. Um, luckily, Laughing Clowns were also doing the ATP shows. Yes. Um, 
So I was doing the Saints and the Clowns, and the Clowns were my saviour. You know, they were, yeah. it was a lot of fun doing that, whereas the Saints were... You know, I know people like the shows, and I'm glad that they did, but they were a lot of work in a way yeah. that I don't think is all that good. You know, like yeah. I don't think it's fine to work towards achieving something, but this was just a... Uh, you know, an effort to kind of get through. Then yeah. Chris and I did um, uh, a month of shows as a duo up and down the East Coast. We did, we did, um, you know, like a Wednesday in Brisbane, a Thursday in Sydney, and then uh, a Friday in Melbourne. And then next week we'd do the, the same thing in the same clubs. That had a lot of potential, I thought, but in the end... Uh, Chris kind of bailed on it. I don't mm. know if he. I, th- I think he was largely just over here because he was in the process of doing a new record. Um, um, so maybe he wasn't that focused on on what we were doing. But I thought that was sort of that that was kind of working. Mm. Um, but yeah, generally, I mean, that, I, I I don't I don't regret not. Getting back together yeah. again, I just wish that some things had, had kind of been resolved. Yeah. Um, but you know, that, that, that's life, so to speak. I mean, it was a very, it was a very uh, Beatlesque, uh, I guess, scenario. And I think if you asked John and Paul, they probably would have said the same thing that we're, we we do better work solo. Yeah, I don't know. I, I thought Chris and I actually worked really well together, but mm. it 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 was. The, the, the musical um, sort of strain was starting to happen. Chris mm. didn't like prehistoric sounds, um, which, you know, I think to anyone who didn't know that would be surprising because I think he sings fantastically on that. His lyrics are really good. Um, but he, he didn't want to do that. He, he, he was, you know, the one song that he wrote on the record by himself um kind of indicates the direction he wanted to go in. And I, I just thought, I, I really don't want to become a power pop band sort of thing. Yeah. And uh, so there, there were there were musical differences, but those musical differences wouldn't be enough to to bring about, you know, I, I mm. don't care what people want to do. You know, it, it, that, that, that's fine. He, he can do whatever he wants musically. And you, I could, you know, and that would still be friends. It, mm. it, you just wouldn't be in the same band, kind of. Thing. And, and and I think it sort of goes back to that very first uh, part in in our conversation, where you know some of us want to settle in our careers, and some of us want to continue to uh, creatively evolve. And and I think you know what you've done in your career um, has been a, a, an incredible lifetime achievement. Well, thanks. Put, put a lot of life into it. <laughs> you, you, you too. Every album has has so much, so much life. And you know, I, I was listening back to some of your your eighties, and 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 it go. You know, it changes in the nineties, and it, it's it is ever evolving. And 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 as as you say, the exploding universe. Well, the the, the funny thing because we're we're doing this reissue campaign, you know, I've done, we've remastered Electrical Storm and mm. Only Steel's Gold and they've both been released. There's um, uh, a singles, a double LP singles compilation that kind of covers that 10-year period. Um, and we're also, I've just finished Frontierland, which has never come out on vinyl before, plus an album that kind of got lost and wasn't what forgotten about really, um, mm. which I recorded a few months after Frontierland, which is uh, called Mr. Miracle with a K. Um, and uh, they're, they're coming out. But the, 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 the thing that having, having gone through this process of listening to music that I've done over a fairly broad period of time, mm. the funny thing about it to me is yes, there's sort of the, the, there are these differences of sound but I, I, they all kind of sound like they're part of the same thing. It doesn't matter how sort of far I think I'm getting from um, 
you know, a starting point, there's always something that kind of brings it back. So, mm. yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that, you know, people find that the records, are, you know, they're different. I, mm. I, do, I do try not to repeat myself too much when I do that. But on the other hand, it also just sort of, oh, you know, the leap isn't that great, you know. Mm. Um, it, it all kind of, I don't know, um, uh, what's the word? Um, what do planets yep. do around the sun? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Rotate. Rotates around the sun, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah but, um, you know, it, it's kind of, it, 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 it's all, all there. It's all part of mm. the one big thing in a way. Mm. So, um yeah. Mm. And now you're touring across uh, from right across September, uh, starting off on uh, the first uh, of September at uh, Wyong, um, and yeah. you've got a few sold out uh, events already. I see. Uh, Canberra's sold yeah, out. Yeah, the ticket sales have been going yeah. pretty well, which is um, yeah. encouraging. That's good. And uh, down in in Tassie, where I am now, uh, September 16 in uh, Hobart at uh, Theatre Royal. Right, is that a good venue? I don't That's know a great venue. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Anywhere in Tassie is a great venue. Come on. <laughs> oh, right, right, right. I'm not okay. biased at all. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, look fantastic and uh, looking forward to uh, re-experiencing your albums again on on vinyl and uh, being a a massive vinyl fan uh, I'm so glad that you are re-releasing them yeah Yeah. great great well there's there's, you know as I say there's Frontierland and um, Mr. Miracle there's an Asteroid Ecosystem album that should be Hopefully, out before the end of this year, Asteroid Ecosystem is my uh, instrumental ensemble. Um, nice. but then there's a, an album that I just finished a little while ago with Jim White that I doubt if it'll come out this year, but early next year, I think. Um, and uh, and then next year, also, we're looking at um, reissuing Black Ticket Day and Laughing Clown's Law of Nature. In fact, I've just, I was just going through the the remasters when you uh, called. Yeah, yeah. Black Ticket Day is definitely one of my favourites. Uh, so, yeah, I'm well, it, looking it, forward yeah, to that one. This, 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 this is, yeah, this is, uh, this is I, I think, you know, I mean, I, sometimes, you know, people kind of, Say a uh, remaster and blah 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 blah. What was wrong with the old one? There wasn't anything really wrong with the old one, but this one sounds a little bit better. Yeah. Um. So uh, there wasn't anything that we were really repairing, but um, the technology of doing some of this stuff um, works a bit better. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, look, uh, Ed Cooper, thank you so much for joining me on the show. And uh, where can we go to get your tickets for uh, for your events? Uh, I think you go to edcooper.com. I think that is the centre of the um, universe, really. There should be links that you can follow through on that. And uh, you can also grab the uh, the merch as well uh, with, uh, oh, with all, yeah, of the, yeah, yeah. Uh, all of the albums, all the vinyls, uh, some nice, uh, nice coloured vinyl there as well, which makes it sound so much better. Well, the funny, the funny thing is I used to be anti-coloured vinyl, you know, um, yeah. because... In the old days, coloured vinyl always sounded like crap. It was like it's, really that's static. so true, yeah. You know, and so I was really dubious about that because Remote Control, who who are reissuing these, um, which is all the stuff, you know, they said, "Oh, we should do some coloured vinyl." And I said, "Ah," and I said, "No, no, no, it's a lot better these days." And yeah. uh, they're right. I mean, it sounds fantastic. The gold, I, you know, you wouldn't think putting on a gold piece of vinyl would sound like anything other than your your stylus getting fucked up. <laughs> but it actually it sounds it sounds like, you know, audio file quality vinyl. It's brilliant. It does. <laughs> it does. It does. I love it. I love it. All right, Ed, thank you so much for joining me on the show. I really appreciate uh, you giving so much uh, time and uh, I know you 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 you're so busy with, with other interviews, so thank you so much. Yeah, an absolute pleasure. Thanks for thanks for having me on. Cheers. 
Thanks for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Long Way to the Top. Hit plus or follow to subscribe to the podcast and head over to Facebook at the Long Way to the Top podcast and give us a like. Keep on rocking and I'll catch you on the next episode of Long Way to the Top. Long Way to the Top.